My name is Jonathan Ng, and I'm with my colleague Zach Kahn of the Center for Presidential History. Today is Saturday, it's October 28th, 2023, and I have the pleasure to speak today with Lizanne Eisen. How are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. And thank you again for, for sitting for this conversation. Uh, perhaps you could begin by introducing yourself and talking about how you first encountered Walter Lefebvre. Sure, thanks. My name, as you said, is Lizanne Eisen, and I first met Walt, um, uh, Professor Lefebvre, when I was an undergraduate at Cornell. I started at Cornell in 1990. I was a government major, um, always knew I wanted to be a government major, and um, had not really thought about history. And then I happened into uh, Professor Lefebvre's um, foreign policy class and, as a sophomore. And so, you know, went to class, went to office hours, and I happened to mention that I was looking for a job. And um, Professor Lefebvre said to me, well, it so happens I'm looking for a research assistant. And I said, well, gosh, that, that would be terrific. And, um, and so in addition to taking Professor Lefebvre's classes, I also became his research assistant and I stayed in Ithaca over the summers um, as an undergrad and, and, and worked with Walt on a number of his books. Um, and that's how I really first encountered him was, was going to office hours because, uh, and, and climbing, um, <laughs> His office was at the top of McGraw Hall, and you took the stairs um, because the elevator was uncertain at best. And, and you climbed all the way to the top of McGraw Hall, and you sat and you waited until, until he was available. And, and it, was, it was sort of a weekly endeavor that I didn't undertake for, for many of my other classes. Um, and you know, thus it led me to become a history major. So I stayed as a government major and became a double major. So Walt had a big influence on me. Well, those, that's a wonderful story. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the experience of talking with um, Lefebvre during office hours. It's some of the authors in the, the book, Thinking Otherwise, which will uh, be released soon, talk about how there was often a long line waiting for um, Lefebvre's office hours. Uh, but he, he seemed to exert a special appeal to students. Uh, he certainly did. Um, I, I, I had many friends who were jealous that I got to be his research assistant. Um, you know, going to office hours was, it was just part of the week. It, for me, it was something I scheduled um, back before the days of electronic calendars. You know, you had a, a calendar that you wrote things down in, um, and it was on my calendar, just like each of my classes. And it was the opportunity to sit and talk and listen and learn with someone who was actually talking to you, not at you. and. Mm. Um, trying to draw out parallels and cause you to think critically about a situation. I, um, you know, I really credit Professor Lefebvre with teaching me the first beginnings of seeing things in context and understanding um, who's doing what to whom and why and, and really in a historical context, stepping outside of the primary text to see the things that were happening in the broader society to drive, drive understanding of why someone might be saying something. What are they trying to achieve with that? Hmm. Which for me was incredibly relevant in, in my chosen profession. So I am grateful it was the beginning of that. Well, that's really cool. Uh, <clears throat> One thing that sort of um, I find intriguing about Lefebvre is that uh, I get the impression that he was sort of a mild-mannered gentleman who did not make huge gestures in class. Um, he was not an attention seeker, and yet he was able to inspire so many students um, and attract such a dynamic following on, on campus. Um, what do you think about his teaching style um, most resonated with you, or um, what did you find distinctive or, or useful about his, uh, 
his, his teaching instruction? Sure. Um, that's a good question. I think about that a lot now um, because I actually also am teaching. And although I, I teach seminars, so I don't ever have four to 500 people in the room, I, I try and keep my classes smaller. I do really think a lot about what was so engaging about Professor Lefebvre's classes. And you know, you you rushed in to sit down and Walt would walk in and he would write never, I can't, very rarely even five, but most often four topics that we were gonna cover and you wrote, again, back in the day, we wrote them down with a pen and paper. There were no computers or things like that. And we, um, we sat there and you could watch him walk through and how everything tied together. And it was as if it was a conversation. He was, it, it felt like he was musing about history. He spoke with no notes uh, ever. And I, it was just an engaging discussion, literally that you sat and listened to and wrote down the, the salient points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, as someone who does teaching myself, I don't know how we did that. Going to the classroom with no notes <clears throat> each time. Um, yes, and and as someone who then was his research assistant, I, I had the opportunity to say, you know, is it because you've been teaching it for so long and it's history and it doesn't change? Or, you know, how is it that you do this? And, you know, every year he would update, revise his thinking, change. It was never the same lecture. and. He, he had just a marvelous way of talking um, and engaging you with his, with his presentation. It, 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 he, was, he was truly gifted as, an as, as a teacher. Well, those sound like very beautiful memories. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more about what your experience as uh, his research assistant uh, entailed. Sure, so it entailed um, typing on his manual typewriter um, and creating notes and, and taking, you know, passages of books that he was interested in and getting those pulled out and put into format that he could then use to write from. Um, it involved finding, finding materials, reading materials. Um, I also, I laugh a little because it also involved house sitting for he and Sandy uh, when um, they would go away. And um, I must say, Sandy had gorgeous plants and I was always terrified that I was going to kill her orchids, um, for, either from over or under watering them. Um, was a big, um, it was a big responsibility for me. I was, um, I, I really, it was the, one of the most formative things of my college experience. Mm. Do you th um, think that there are certain lessons that you, you took from that experience as his research assistant that maybe you carried with you into graduate school or your current career um, at Cornell? Yes, yeah, so organization, attention to detail, um, always seeking to, to, get to get to understanding are things that I took away from that experience. Um, not sort of accepting somebody else's viewpoint, always making sure that I understood what, what uh, again, we weren't in the room, so it was hindsight, but understanding to the best of our ability what was driving decisions um, and thoughts and actions and really um, putting it into that broader, cultural perspective to understand it. Mm. One thing that I find intriguing about Lefebvre is that he, his, his range of scholarship was so sweeping. I mean, he, he addresses U.S. relations with so many different countries. There are so many different themes. Um, and all of his books, they're very rigorously argued and researched. Um, and yet it's clear that there are contemporary um, political or social issues that inspire him inspired him to conduct that line of research. I was wondering, um, did, did he ever talk about current events or politics in the classroom? Um, some of the authors in the anthology 
give, uh, lend the impression that he was maybe a little bit tight-lipped or, or reluctant to talk about current politics, even though that, that clearly was, he clearly was very concerned with what was happening in the moment. Uh, yes, uh, tight-lipped is a generous description. There was no discussion in the classroom about that. And in all my years um, as an undergraduate, we did not um, we did not really ever talk about politics. Um, it was only after I graduated and would go back and and visit with Walt and Sandy that we even maybe touched on politics a little bit. Um, and I wouldn't even say politics necessarily more, um, I will call them themes of the day. Um, and it was, it was not something that Walt, Walt often shared about and certainly not with his students. Um, the one thing I will say though about that is that he was immensely proud of his student, his former mm -hmm. students and that resonated very deeply with each of us who had the opportunity to be in his class and and go to office hours and in my case you know be his research assistant it um he he it was quite clear that what he valued in them was their service their dedication their thoughtfulness and the fact that they were out in the world making a difference and and that truly um it was quite clear that those were values to be um, to uh, to go out and emulate. Um, and he made that quite clear, um, not because he said you should, but because of his his admiration and for his former students. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Because it, it seems that part of his legacy wasn't simply in the classroom or through his scholarship, but by maintaining these relationships with students and sort of being a mentor, even after um, the time that uh, traditionally uh, teachers would stop being mentors. Um, uh, you talked about, for instance, after you graduate, you were still uh, interacting with his family and were having conversations. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, so, you know, it's a phrase I've adopted um, in my classes as well, based on the experience that, that Walt gave um, to me, which is once in, once in I, I like to say once in Walt's class, once in my class, always in my class. You, once you had, had gone and engaged with Professor Lefebvre, you were really, you were in, he was a resource. He was, uh, there was never a time when you would call or write to Walt with a question or just to say hello, that there wasn't a really wonderful, deep and rich uh, engagement and um, so many of his students availed themselves of that relationship and it was one of his I, I think it's one of his legacies I mean as you as you may have seen at the Beacon Theater when he came to give give his last lecture in New York City you know 3,000 people showed up um, that it, <clears throat> that legacy really he inspired a lot of people and he stayed in touch with many people. I will say as his, um, as his research assistant and house sitting, um, there were times when folks would show up when they were away and, and say, what do you mean? He's not, I'm just house sitting. He's not here. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, I think, uh, th that, Legacy, you always knew if you had a, a, a problem, a, you know, an intellectual problem, you could call in and really get wonderful advice and really talk it through with someone who wasn't going to give you an answer, but give you maybe a new way of thinking about something. Mm. That's really, that's really uh, beautiful. Uh, it makes me wonder, though, honestly, how he was, how he was able to do all this because uh, he was clearly a, a, an excellent teacher, an excellent scholar, and also someone who was really concerned about the broader lives of his students once they left the classroom. Are there any secrets to maybe his time management or his life philosophy or uh, lessons or just observations you extracted um, that might help us understand uh, how he managed to, to balance these different responsibilities and 
maintain such an engaged uh, schedule? Well, I, I he had had so much energy that I will say um, I I think you know he he lived very close to campus. He could walk, and so he walked to campus every day. And um, you know the other thing is his he and Sandy were an amazing team, and she was really so much part of every. Uh, those student interactions and engaging with students and and having people in the house and when um, former students would come back. Um, so there wasn't that separation of, oh, I'm going to see students. They would come to they would come to Walton Sandy's house and and they were really a team. And so, you know, um, their children were grown and out of the house by the time I got by the time I got to college. And so I didn't I didn't see him balancing, you know, small children and the like, but, um, you know, knowing how he engaged with, with students when I was there and former students, it was really, um, you know, Sandy was an um, integral part of, of that. And, you know, I, I think that I, I want to come back to what I said or um, the question I didn't fully answer, answer before uh, about former students and mentoring. You know, I think one of the really great things for current students was to see that relationship because when people would come, former students, um, Professor LeFever would talk about that. And you could tell how proud he was. And, and that, again, it was that really that sense of this is a long term relationship that you're building. And the, again, the values to ascribe to. Of, of service and giving back and thoughtfulness um, and being an engaged citizen. Hmm. Yeah, uh, hearing you talk about um, his wife Sandy Lefebvre's uh, role in all this, I think that that's also very much a crucial element. Mm -hmm. um, he even, I uh, believe they met in undergrad. Um, she was really supportive and important to him during his graduate mm -hmm. uh, research um, years at University of Wisconsin. and so. She's always sort of been an essential part of the dynamic. Um, I'd like to, if we could, maybe um, go back to uh, some questions about uh, the classroom. Um, are there any particular lessons or uh, classroom moments or um, or topics that really stick out in your in your memory? So when you think about uh, attending his courses as a, as a student. Um, I, I can still, I mean, I can still remember rushing to get there, to get a seat and to, um, uh, to get a, a seat where I could see the board and really, and really be engaged, not sort of at, in many classes I sat in the back and took notes. Uh, this was not such a class for me. Um, and it was always enjoyable and I always left thinking, thinking about the topic of the day. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, I think Professor Lefebvre was such an engaging lecturer in part because coming back to what you said about Sandy, um, she really, um, I think early on gave him some pointers about how to do that and, and was helpful in his lecture style. That, that's a very interesting um comment, I, I can definitely see how that would be helpful. Even in his uh, Beacon Theater um, lecture, he, he references um, Sandy. Um, did you have the opportunity to attend that? Uh, the Beacon Theater? Absolutely. I would not have missed that mm. for the world. Yeah, can you, can you talk about that very special night a little bit? Sure. Um, it w I mean, the energy in the room was you know, palpable. There were 3,000 Cornellians there to celebrate, truly celebrate one of their favorite professors who in many cases had a lasting impact on their, on their lives. Um, you know, the lecture was classic, um, classic Walt. He, you know, he walked up and instead of just launching into a topic, 
you know, it was let me thank everyone and let mm -hmm. me start with Sandy. And then let me tell you a little bit about the, remind you of the, without saying, oh, I'm gonna remind you of the history of Cornell and how formative it was and where all the amazing things that Cornell is doing, all you alumni donors, without even saying it, right? Um, his, he started with that and it was so gracious and wonderful and um, just truly true to form from, from start to finish. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Um, yeah, that's w one thing that really struck me was how seamless the introduction where he very graciously is thanking everybody and he's mentioning all these different names, but in a way that it doesn't sound long-winded. It's, it's engaging and you get a sense of the, the human dimension of the university and the people who actually make the institution possible and then seamlessly transitions into a, a, a sort of a magnificent um, uh, analysis of uh, you know, a, huge, a huge stretch of US foreign policy. I mean, he basically begins with the early republic and then he ends with Wilson. So yeah, very masterfully done. Absolutely. Um, I, well, and, and coming back to your um, question about current events, without, um, without saying he's talking about current events, talking about China and the importance of China and the rise of China um, and, and the role of building bridges, right? And, you know, talks about that without, w without pointing a finger at, you know, gee, you really ought to be thinking about this. Mm. So it just, it was, it was great. And I re I've actually, I rewatched it um, this past week before I got here. And then of course, um, you know, it, it showing at the conference. So we watched it last night again. Nice. Well, um, we, we have a bit more time. I'm just going to, to check to make sure. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I'm curious, did, well, Lefebvre's legacy inspire you to um, decide to work at Cornell in particular? Sure. So it was a bit circuitous for me. So I went to law school um, at Penn. Um, I was deciding between staying and getting a master's in history and, uh, and going to law school at Cornell and going to Penn. And I decided um, that I was probably headed more in the corporate world than the academic world. So. Uh, so I ended up going to Penn for law school. I stayed in touch with Walt and Sandy. And then when I, um, when I went to, I worked on Wall Street, I worked at a firm called Cravath, Swain and & More. And when I called Walt to, again, because back in the day you didn't email, you, you actually picked up the telephone and called. Um, I called Walt to tell him that I had gotten an offer at a law firm called Cravath, Swain and & More. And he, he said to me, oh, you're going to the old Seward firm. Uh, because Cravath is a firm that was started by um, Lincoln's Secretary of State and, and he had been a partner there. And so Walt was quite pleased that I had chosen the appropriate firm um, to go to work. And, and I worked there for um, more than 20 years. I was a partner there. And um, when I retired, that's when I decided to start teaching. And for me, um, um, even though I didn't go to Cornell Law School, there was really no place that I wanted to teach other than Cornell. Mm. Um, it, um, my, it, it's just still for me the formative experience. And so that's, that's in part why, and they were opening uh, the Cornell Tech campus so I could be in New York City and teach subjects that were um, near and dear to my heart. Um, and I have taught up in Ithaca as well. Mm. That's cool. Um, yeah, thinking about sort of his, his broader legacy, what, what do you think ultimately um, his, his impact on you personally is? And then maybe for, for C Cornell as, as a broader institution? Sure. So, um, you know, Walt started for me the, the, the thinking of seeing who, you know, seeing the bigger picture and why things are happening. And as someone who worked on transactions, on deals, on Wall Street, understanding people's motivations was key to success. Mm. So he started that for me um, and really 
seeing beyond just what's in front of you and what people aren't saying as well. And so for me personally, he he really started the foundations of, for me, what was a very successful career. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and um, for the university, I think um, he inspired generations of students who think very warmly about their undergraduate experience in large part because of him. And he stayed engaged. He created, um, you know, he created this cohort, very large cohort across all of the, the colleges, not just arts and sciences and not just history majors, um, to, to see really the value of their Cornell education and to, to value their experience at Cornell. And that, um, that camaraderie, that loyalty that he, that he really brought in so many people was, um, you know, is an enduring legacy. You know, he's, he said uh, in his Beacon address that, you know, Frank, that Frank wrote, President Rhodes of Cornell really transformed the, um, the and that happens to have been when I was there, the university physically and in some cases intellectually. And I would argue actually that Wall, across a much lar longer time span, had so much to do with perpetuating the, the modern day values of Cornell. Um, and really is, you know, the university and we all owe him a debt of gratitude for that. Hmm. One thing that you were talking about that caught my attention um, is at various times you've mentioned his attention to individual motives and the complexity of an individual's life and how they interact with the broader society, whether that's him analyzing the motivations of certain historical figures in the classroom or in his work, or it's helping you um, uh, uh, think about the individual motives of the, the people that you're working with, the cases that you, you were working on. Um, and I think that's something that's often rare in a, in a historian uh, or difficult for scholars to do is to try to burrow into the minds of the, the people that we study and to understand um, what actually is making them tick and how they fit into the, the bigger picture. I want to clarify, it's not so much that he would burrow into the minds. He was not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. He would look at the broader picture and say, what's happening in society? Why might someone be writing an article about this topic? Mm -hmm. You know, we often, um, we often see particularly foreign policy from our external perspective without understanding domestic politics. And so he actually brought that to bear both in the United, you know, understanding what was happening domestically in the United States that might be impacting foreign policy, as well as looking in other places what might be impacting their foreign policy back to us. And not so much psychology, more cultural context. No, that that's great. Um, this is this has been wonderful. Uh, are there any other uh, memories, uh, reflections? Um, or other thoughts that you would like to, to put into the record? I would just like to say that um, I was, a, a, you know, I was a government major, set on being a government major, and, um, you know, Professor Lefebvre's class changed me into a history major and led me to understand the value of the study of history, uh, even for someone who might want to engage in, in current uh, government, foreign policy, and um, as a critical way of thinking and, and being self-reflective. And so I would, I would just like to say thank you. Well, that's a very wonderful note for us to close on. And thank you for participating in this interview. Thank you.